Vantor, Robin Frins and Jean-Carl Verne a point back. Now, Laurence Vantor moves away for this weekend from Bose co-drivers. He is teamed with René Rast and Marcus Winkelhock, with whom he won this event last year. And depending on who finishes where, it could be that you could win the championship this weekend because you score points at the six-hour mark, the 12-hour mark, and at the end of 24 hours. And the next round at the Nürburgring this year is only, in quotes, a three-hour normal duration Blancpain race, and therefore it has the minimum number of points, not like previous years when the last round has been a 1,000K race. And so more points on offer this year. It is just a three-hour. We had the 1,000K race, remember, at Ricard last time out. So there's the championship situation to factor in as well, and that's something to keep us on our toes on Sunday morning, perhaps, right? rather than now. This is really all about lap times. 20 cars have this opportunity to set a lap time. They get a release slot at 20 second intervals, although there is five seconds before and after grace. Uh, you don't have to leave absolutely on the split second. There is just a little bit of wriggle room for the teams. But if you miss it outside of that tolerance, the five second tolerance, then you are in trouble. In theory, you don't have to do this session. You could skip it, start in the traffic and save yourself a set of tires. But there is pride at stake, and also, the higher up the grid you are, the less likely you are to get caught in traffic at the very start of the race. And remember, that is something that we've had in the past. Remember last year's Spa 24-hour race and just how much drama we had? The team certainly do. The race director certainly does. And, of course, new for this year is going to be the full-course yellow, which has been trailed in the Blancpain Endurance Series. You've seen similar variants, slow zones or... Uh, virtual safety cars and other championships and that is another way of neutralizing the race should it be necessary it's bone dry here it's clouding over a bit an hour and a half or so ago it was sunny skies it is certainly cooler and it is certainly cloudier above spa but tomorrow we are hearing it is going to be a very wet spa and that is something that the teams could do without as you look at nick katzberg getting ready to go in 46 David Addison and John Watson with you for the weekend here at the Total 24 Hours of Spa and looking forward to what's going to be an intriguing top 20 shootout here with also, of course, one of the cars to look for this weekend, the car of Alex Zanardi, Bruno Spengler and Timo Glock and Bruno Spengler, DTM champion, will do the driving duties in this session, a car that's got to be adapted, of course, for Alex as well as for Bruno and for Timo. So, as I say, they will leave in the reverse order. The fans are ready, and so are Watty and I for what's always an interesting session. At John, at what is still a classic racetrack. Goes back longer than me. <laughs> I mean, in fact, goes back to the 30s. I mean, it was a, a stunning racetrack. Yeah. It has changed as everything has done. Call it progress if you like. Eau Rouge, well, I don't think Dick Seaman or Von Braukic or Nuvolari would call that Eau Rouge, yeah. but that's the corner. And it is still a massive challenge, particularly in a GT3 car. And yes, I mean, if you put it in the context of modern day, newly built circuits, corners like that just don't exist anymore, do they? And all the more shame that they don't, because yeah. I mean, you've got three really fantastic corners around, the Spa circuit, Eau Rouge, and Braddy on that whole complex. Then down through Puhu, that long double left-hand corner, big, big commitment. And then of course, coming back up the hill through Burnville, can I take it flat? Well, certainly in this uh, Super Pool shootout, it'll have to be taken flat because otherwise you're not going to be at the races. Now, everybody says in a 24-hour race, oh, qualifying doesn't matter. But yes, it does really, doesn't it? Because A, there's pride, and B, you don't want to be too far down the grid and caught up in traffic. So although the teams sometimes say, oh, you know, we don't really want to do Super Pole, the commitment is going to be there. They all want to come out of this with, of course, as good a lap time as they possibly can. Well, if that's the case, why have WRT put in Lawrence Van Thor, Frank Stipter, Nicky <laughs> Team, Andre Lotro, <laughs> Bentley got Stephen King and Maxime Soule, BMW, Bruno Spengler, Black Falcon, Mercedes Germa Berman, BMW, Maxime Martin, Nicky. If they don't care, why do they put their top drivers in? I mean, are they, you know, you know what? Of course they care. There's pride and prestige in being the honour of having pole position. Oh, absolutely, yes. And if you remember back two years ago when Pierre Luigi uh, Alessandro Pierguini yes. pole position or on the front row of the grid of course he went and spun out of this very part of the track literally the, yes. the race was about 50 or no maybe about 30 seconds old it was a hell of a moment wasn't it that so the first man out is Frank Pereira the second man to go is Stephen Kane in Bentley number 7 Bentley of course had, by this stage last year had a couple of wins 12 months on, life has been a bit tougher, hasn't it, for the Bentley project? 
Yes and no. I think a little bit of it is down to the great success that they enjoyed last year. And of course, the, the essence of uh, you know, Blancpain endurance and sprint racing is that no one manufacturer is going to dominate. And thank goodness mm. we have that kind of philosophy. But that also means the balance of performance is being continually adjusted and tweaked to ensure that no one manufacturer is always dominant. And I mean, Bentley had two great successes last year. They were very, very strong in the 6R race that Paul Ricard chased along with Nissan two of the physically largest cars yes, on sure. the racetrack, yes. you know, punching a hole in the air that Mike Tyson would love to have done. <laughs> and they won the race and came second. So I think they're very much back at the races. Now, what they were doing in the free practice sessions over Friday is, in a sense, not relevant, totally. But they're in now into the, this top 10, top 20 shootout. Um, so they're quick and they will be quick and they want to be at the front of the field they don't want to be bogged down as we know what happens if you get bogged down somewhere between 20 and 40 in the grid it's a nightmare oh absolutely absolute yes. nightmare and as you say you've got all the big hitters going out in this session there in 99 is Steph Dusseldorp the first person we're going to see times from is from Pereira here in the BMW Z4 this is a Pro-Am class car there are a number of Pro-Am drivers with the pros, of course, doing the time uh, within this uh, Super Pole competition. You've got Frank Pereira, you've got Matt Griffin, you've got Alexander Sims. The one I'm looking at is the Leonard Motorsport Aston Martin. Stefan Mucha will be in that mm. car, but it is a pro-am car. They've got three pros and one sort of sort of am. <laughs> Where is the, where's the am in that car? It's three to one pro. Yes, exactly. And Mucha, you talk about that year Alessandro Pioli Edi had his moment. It was Stefan Mucha on pole position that year, wasn't it? It was so indeed. Don't bet against him. Yeah, that, that's great right. Deal. Yeah. Uh, ice cream all round. Uh, it, it could happen again. You never know. Let's see whether or not well, we can get a I mean, Stefan Mucha weeks, pole. Two weeks ago, they won at British Ryan to the GT Championship here. That's right. So the car like Spark and there's also not only the battle for pole there's the battle to be the top Belgian you've got Laurence Vantour and Maxime Martin going head to head and they will be the last two drivers to come across the timing line so a benchmark time will be offered up by uh, Frank Pereira but of course he was first out more and more cars leave the pits traffic management is an element of this he's got to beat traffic now he's got another BMW just ahead of him coming through the sequence of I'll go back to the Bentley coming through Lake Coombe so there you can see there's a McLaren on track and uh, one of the two Von Ryan racing cars, whether it's Kevin Estra or Aldaro Parent, can't quite tell. But that's going to be a key and you think with the relatively few cars on track now in comparison to the 58 or so cars that will take the light side on Saturday afternoon. This shouldn't be a problem. McLaren is getting out of the way doing the right thing. Yeah. And that again, courteous and just good manners. That's Alvaro Parent. The white one is Parent. The orange one is the Kevin Astra car and the Bentley quicker than the BMW in the first sector. So this is the car to look for. Well, where's the Bentley's performance gone then, David? <laughs> Looks pretty handsome to me. Mind you, it's been driven by an Ulsterman. Oh, well, that must be it. That it makes a difference. It does make a difference. It makes yeah. a big difference here, I've, I've particularly, particularly in Belgium, because I know that Stephen Kane absolutely adores frit and mayo. Don't we all? And I've checked the balance of performance and I can't find a clause about Ulsterman in there. So you seem to get away scot-free. Stephen Kane is on it. Look at this. Yeah, but again, <laughs> I keep repeating, abuse of track limits we saw yesterday in mm. practice two cars with the fact one of the ferraris that had gone quickest had its time taken away so you've no. got to be so again looking so close to running right off the track coming into blanchemont and again this is going to be observed by the stewards and if they believe anybody has gained an, adv an advantage an unfair advantage that time is going to be deleted and of course in the race if you do it you're going to end up with penalties so they just have to keep away from those track limits as you rightly say over the line the gun time Stephen Kane a 218.4 quicker than Frank Pereira had a little word with Laurent Van Four at lunchtime lovely lunch in the ID hospitality I thought I'd see you in there David but I think you're just <laughs> doing the usual thing knocking your pipe out with another race commentary <laughs> I said Laurent what's going to be pole time do you think it'll be a 16 17 he feels and it's all dependent on track temperature. Uh, Stephen Kane really ringing the neck of the oh. Bentley. Absolutely on the personal best now, having had purple to the previous lap. Yeah. And that was middle 17s, I think, was the, 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 the maximum potential time that uh, Lawrence Van Thor could see. And I'm assuming he's referring to what he will do in his own uh, Series 2 WRT RD.
So, eight Bentley heads up towards the timing line. This is Maxime Soule at the wheel of the car that he shares for the weekend with uh, Max Book and Andy Suchek. Interesting that it's the Belgian driver that's given the duties. I would have said perhaps Andy Suchek was the quicker driver in that car, but Maxime Soule goes over the timing line and actually goes quicker than Stephen Kane because that was a 2.18.350. He was only quicker than Stephen Kane in the last sector, but strung together well enough, that was the lap. Now, there is Vincent Abril, who is making his 24-hour debut. That looks like a, I mean, I've never seen a Bentley. I mean, even in the showroom, I've never seen one. It's different, isn't painted. it? Painted. I mean, you might see something like that parked outside Harrods right now <laughs> for the summer season, <laughs> and really getting very bold, and that's unfair, unkind. And he's pulled into the pit lane, and uh, what's he going to do? No, he's not. Sorry, he was just re-lining up so he could have a, a second go. So his one flying lap, and Rennie Rast looking at that and thinking, "Ooh, maybe we're going to get penalised." Well, certainly the car was bought, wasn't it? Now, what can Stephen Kane do? He did the, per the absolute best in the first sector, but he's down in the middle sector by six tenths of a second. So I don't think, I'm afraid, this is going to be good enough from Stephen. Whatever has caused him to lose out in the middle sector, when it could have been traffic, has gone against him. Yeah, certainly, I mean, very, very committed all the way around to that. Can he maybe just tidy it up through this final chicane? There's not an awful lot you can do. It's sort of slow in and just try to get the power, feed it in and get a good strong drive as he comes across the line and it's a 219 so he is slower indeed than his provisional second quickest time Alvaro Parent there fourth what about Kevin S as he comes up towards the line Kevin S is about to complete his first flying lap a personal and an absolute best 2183 to beat let's see where he's going to slot in as he comes over the timing line and he goes quickest of all 218147 and i think that could have been a slightly quicker lap from Kevin S because when he came into the chicane, he was a little bit too far over to the left on the exit to get that really ideal cut back and then a straighten up as much as possible coming onto pitch straight. But a great time by Kevin Estra. No surprise, of course. <laughs> Andrea Piccini in the Ferrari goes through. The Ferraris are pro-ams and Piccini now is on to a flying lap. So uh, he has his first run. This is it. Six Audi is the Marcel Fassel, Andre Lotterer, Mike Rockenfeller car. Le Mans winners all, and Andre Lotterer is the man doing driving duties in this session. And this is coming up to the end of his first flying lap. What about Vincent Abril's Bentley? His first was a gentle 2.21. Of course, he was bought, as we saw, so yeah, he's so if, only got one shot. One well, shot in fact, that, that was Andre Lotterer, that was in the Audi. Mm. And again, during the lunch break, having a chat with Andre, and again, the whole issue about uh, he's a driver of course coming from another sphere of motorsport where in the dominant rd team that he's in everybody gets out of your way yes. it's, it's actually quite difficult to realize that well i might have to give somebody a bit of track space when uh, i'm on this out lap preparing to do my own flying lap yes the first time andre lotter came and did the spa 24 hours he was harpooned by adam christodoulou in the bus stop and that damaged the audi and uh, cost them any good chance of a result. Well, here, coming up towards the bus stop, is number two, which is Frank Stippler in the WRT car. This is his first lap, two personal bests. It's going to be good. Is it good enough to beat a 218.147? The answer is no. He goes second, but he missed out by four thousandths. That's all. Yeah, Frank Stippler was quickest in the final four sessions last night. Now there, McLaren, literally four wheels off the racetrack. I mean, again, coming out of Blanchemont, you might cite that the BMW was the cause of the exit, but just, just I don't know, I'm, I'm exasperated that I'm seeing so much track abuse. It's Alvaro Parent, the abuser, and he comes up towards the line and he goes third. And I think that car did compromise him because he'd done an absolute and a personal best. And in the last sector, OK, it was good, but it wasn't good enough. And so he ends up third. It is S ahead of Stippler. So what can Vantor do? He has yet to do his first lap. We've also yet to see anything, of course, out of Andrea Piccini or Maxime Martin. What about Mercedes in this session? 21 is Yelma Berman for Black Falcon. Yelma Berman, 14th on his first lap. Kevin Est, Frank Stippler, Alvaro Parent, Maxim Soule, Vincent Abril, Stephen Kane is your top six. Bruno Spengler is seventh. Nick Katzberg is eighth. And there, in 99 Mercedes, is Steph Dusseldorp. Now, he's 13th at the moment. So, Yelma Berman, got the clear air. So, it's up to him. Oh, and again, just again, this, everybody is right on the absolute limit. Again. And over it. And, over, and again, this is the exit coming from, we used to call it Stavolo. It's now called Courbe Paul Frere. I think I prefer Stavolo.
Indeed, up towards the end of the lap comes 21, which is Yelma Berman. How wide does he go? Acceptable. That lead, he had two wheels, the two inside wheels, just about inside the line. Yeah. But any more where you get all four wheels off or outside that line coming into Blanchemont or out of Blanchemont. Again, just, you see, such a fine line between abuse and getting away with it. So over the line goes the Mercedes, Yelma Berman 11th. Of course, those that have done their two laps now into the pit. So Matt Griffin, 19th, Alexander Sims, 20th. Steph Dusseldorp has pitted, he's 16th. Stephen Kane has pitted, he is 9th. And now Andrea Piccini's Ferrari has done the absolute best in the first sector. This is Lawrence Vanthor, and he, on his first effort, went 14th. He's just done a personal best. It's interesting that the G2 uh, the R8, they are now sort of beginning to get a handle on this car. Yeah. It took a little bit of development because a lot of the running with the Pirelli tyre having to make the adjustments to make the car work on that tyre where previously little testing had been done on a Michelin tyre. We have Frank Stippler, the fastest, on a 2.18.1. This Ferrari of Andrea Piccini has done the absolute best in the first sector, four tenths quicker than Stippler. But Vantor is seven tenths slower than this Ferrari in the first sector. So, Lawrence Vantor has got to be very, very good in sectors two and three to salvage the lap. And all cars are under investigation for track limits. So what we see now may not be the end of the story. No. And I'll tell you what, if that is going to be developed, uh, we could see an entirely different top 20 from that we're oh, watching right good. now. Because it will be then your next best lap. And that's why your next best lap is as important. But if you've abused the track on your next best lap, what happens then? You get put to the back of Super Pole and you have third. to rely on your qualifying time of yesterday. Piccini went third, lost out in the last sector. 2.18.1. This is Lawrence Vantor. Personal best, absolute best. 2.18.1 to beat. Thumbs up about track limits from a learned colleague. And down to the bus stop. He's got the right, he's got the left, and the squirt up to the timing line. Now, don't forget, there's Maxime Martin yet to go. And Maxime has done two personal bests on this lap. This could be pole for Vantor. Let's see. He goes over the timing line now. It's only sixth. Sixth fastest, Lawrence Vantor. But again, second sector. This is the man who really was quickest overall yeah. on Friday, 218.6. Again, overruns going into the first part of the final chicane compromises his exit speed as a consequence and therefore the speed across the start finish line is going to be that little bit slower oh. 12 maxime 12 fastest and all that time wasn't just lost in the final chicane nevertheless it's a poor effort for what we know that both car and driver are capable of and so those that have done their laps now make their way down to the pit lane and frank stippler will take Provisional pole position, I emphasise the word provisional, given the track limits investigations. I wonder what odds you'd have got on Frank Stippler being on pole position. I mean, I, one of the things about Frank is, I just don't believe he has it in him to abuse anything. I mean, I, I mean, a track limit aside. Well, it did happen last night. Was he one of the ones he, who got he, caught? Oh yeah, he was one of the abusers, yeah. But Team WRT, very, very happy indeed. Car two then, which is Frank Stippler, Nico Muller and Stefan Ortelli are the car's drivers that will start from pole position. Nico Muller, of course, he's new to GT racing this year to dovetail with his DTM. Stefan Ortelli, winner here in 03. Frank Stipper has won here as well in the and, and, of course, all three drivers extremely media-friendly. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get all three, if not two of them, on the grid before the start of this 24-hour endurance event here at spa Frankershaw. And there is Frank Stipper, who's about to uncoil himself from the car. He dwarfs Stefan Ortelli, doesn't he? And, of course, it's a real compromise to get them all uh, ready for this uh, car. So, Frank Stippler is on pole position for Team WRT, the team run by Vincent Voss, who's with OJ Borg. Vincent, a, fa a fabulous performance by Frank Stippler there to take pole. Well, I think, uh, yeah, it was a, a very, very strong lap. I mean, especially he was one of the guy who, uh, uh, who got better in the second lap, and uh, I think he got all of the car. A very happy garage as well. How important is it for you to do well at this race? Well, to the race, it's very important, as everyone knows. It's one of the big races that you really want to be there. And uh, qualifying, it's not so important, but it's always good to know that we are there. And knowing you're at the front of the race, I take it you can't control it for 24 hours. What sort of plan do you take going in? Well, as you can see, as you could see last year, uh, the difference after 24 hours of seven, seven seconds, 
Every little detail is important, every, every pit stop, every uh, passing maneuver, um, every detail is important. So it is not an endurance race anymore, it is uh, 24 times uh, a sprint race. Vincent, thank you. Welcome. So Vincent Voss knows what the battle is going to be like ahead. And last year, of course, it was a battle between Audi and BMW. Expect more of the same this year. But of course, there are other brands like Bentley, like McLaren, that aren't just here to make up the numbers. Very much so. And I think it, it, this race is as un unpredictable as any 24 hour race at Spa has ever been. And the pundits can all say, well, we know that WRT and Audi in general, or the Audi, the Phoenix, and the WRT team, historically are so strong across a 24 hour event. But they were pushed all the way last year by the VDS BMW. I mean, that was the highlight of the race, really. I mean, it was overshadowed by some of the awful incidents we saw in the early part of that race. So, great pleasure. And, I mean, they do take pleasure in... And Dr Ulrich there as well. Very happy indeed that one of his products is going to be on pole position. Assuming that with all the investigations that may be being underway right now, that uh, nobody is going to be penalised or if they are going to be penalised, let's penalise the whole lot of them. <laughs> and that doesn't really affect things. A separate investigation is going on between the André Lotter of Vincent Abril uh, cars. Remember, we saw the Audi getting in the way. I've got to say, it's not very much like André Lotter to do that deliberately or to be clumsy, but anyway, he did get in the way of the Bentley. And so that is being looked into as well as Frank Stippler poses for the cameras. The man on pole position then, provisionally, at the end of that session. Winner here in 2012 and still as competitive as ever in a modern GT car as he is in anything historic and he manages to find lots of drives in historic machinery, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And I mean, I think the whole sort of mindset of Frank Stippler is because he drives cars with so little grip, fundamentally historic cars, he can manage these so well. Frank, congratulations. A fantastic drive there. Yeah, it went well. Uh, we had some issues with the balance of the car um, the days before and uh, we sorted it out uh, quite last minute. Um, uh, it's a, only a little step for a 24-hour race to be in a good position and qualifying, but uh, for sure it's an honour in these kind of competitors um, that you are one of the front runners. So um, I'm a little bit proud today, but uh, as I said before, it's, it's just a very little step in front of a, before, just before a 24-hour race. And just a quick word from a driver's point of view on track limits. All the cars are under investigation. Do you feel you're using the track properly? I think so. I, I think I was uh, at least with two uh, wheels uh, on, on track, so... I think it should be fine. Frank, congratulations. Thanks. So Frank Stipper it is then, who sets the best time within that session. And will put himself, of course, then onto provisional pole position. Andre Lotterer there, furrowed brow, perhaps being told now about the investigation involving him and the Bentley. My lap, he said. So. Mm. Well, certainly he's got a, a perplexed yeah. look on his face, and uh, you know, it's an unusual circumstance for a driver of Andre Lotterer's stature to be under investigation uh, because he probably is arguing that, well, I was just about to begin my lap, and it was it's up to the other driver to make his way around. I, I'm assuming that's the, the gist of the argument, but. It, it is a problem, um, particularly even a shootout like this, where there's not very many cars on track, but they will meet at critical yeah. parts, and that final chicane is one of the critical parts of the track. It can spoil a lap that you were on in the case of Vance on Abril, or it could spoil the beginning of a lap for, for Andre Lotter, and he probably would say, well, look, you know, if I compromise, then I was going to lose my lap, and I've only got effectively two laps, so... You know, what am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the argument that will go backwards and forwards and the stewards will listen to and listen to the merits and demerits of everybody's individual case. And nobody's going to be wrong, I can assure you that. <laughs> so these the times then, whether they stand is a different issue. But it's Frank Stippler who sets the fastest lap, a 2.18.1, 17 thousandths quicker than Kevin Astor's McLaren. Former winner, Andrea Piccini, he was Frank Stippler's, one of Frank Stippler's co-drivers in 2012. He's third ahead of Alvaro Parent. Maxim Soule, his exit time from the pit lane is under investigation as well. Sixth, Lawrence Van Tor, seventh in the end, and we barely touched on him. Ben Schneider ahead of Nick Katzberg, his exit time is under investigation as well. Uh, ninth, Vincent Abril, tenth, Stephen Kane, eleventh, Andre Lotterer, and only twelfth, Maxime Martin. 
and so far the list of cars under investigation for track limits is 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 strong looking at the long line we have. Bruno Spengler was 13th, uh, 14th in the end was Yelma Berman and then 15th fastest Stefan Mucker. The Aston Martin never came alive in the way we anticipated. Number five crashed last night. It was rebuilt or repaired at least. Nicky Tim did the time ahead of Franck Pereira. Then Steph Dusseldorf for 18th. Matt Griffin was 19th. And Alexander Sims for a Curia Cost. The Barwell Run BMW rounding out the 20 cars that we had in Super Pole, the top 20 on the grid in the order that will be confirmed tomorrow. Well, what about Kevin Est? 17,000 slower. Let's hear from him with OJ. Kevin, how is the McLaren feeling out there? Well, it felt really good. Um, a lot better than yesterday. Yesterday we were struggling a little bit with the with the pace and with the yeah the the feeling on the, in the car. But uh, today I should say the car was really really good, and uh, I'm impressed and, and surprised about the performance because because uh, we've been far from that yesterday. But uh, apparently the team did a, a mega job uh, yesterday evening and and today to prepare the car and the engineer made made some good decision. So I'm, I'm really, really satisfied. A little, you know, you really, everyone to do the poll and, and to be so close to do the poll for the 24 hours is a bit of a, a small disappointment. But at the end of the day, it's a 24 hour race. We are, uh, we are first row and second row with a sister car. So we have, we show that we have the pace and, uh, and we have great driver lineup and a good team. So I think we can, we can do good, but it's gonna be a really, really long race. Uh, and what is qualifying like? Is it about where your car is on the track or showing the other teams what you've got? Well, it's, you know, it's a teamwork. At the end, you can have the best driver of the world driving a car. If the car is not good, you won't, you won't be able to do the pole, especially when you look at the field there. So everything has to be perfect, has to be spot on, especially for two laps. Um, and I think we were, we were right there today. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a great teamwork. And at the end, as a driver, you need to, to keep your, your, your head uh, kind of cool and, and, and do no mistake, but still push 100%. And when you come to, uh, to Redillon, it's uh, to Eau Rouge, it's, it's a corner where you have to give everything. But if you do a small mistake, your lap is, uh, your lap is screwed. So, uh, so it's kind of a, you have to, to push hard, but, uh, but without doing any mistake and having a great car like, uh, like I had today helped me a lot. And just for us mere mortals who'll never drive that corner, what is it like heading in there flat out? Ah, it's you know every day, every every time when you go through Eau Rouge, it's uh, it's an adventure. You know, it's 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 a lot of fun every every single lap which you make in uh, in Eau Rouge and, and in Blanchiment here. So it's that's what Spa is about. It's just uh, pure speed and and no uh, no run off area and uh, like back in the day. And I and I kind of like this kind of track. So it's. Uh, it's a really, really great pleasure to, to drive here. And just talking about driving here and driving here hard, I think all of the drivers have had problems with track limits. You're under investigation. Do you feel you're using the track fairly? Yeah, I think I was, I was, uh, I was in track limit. I don't, I'm 100% sure I was in track limit. Um, but it's, you have to be really close and, and we are driving at 250K, so uh, two centimeter can make out of track limit or in track limit. So it's, uh, it's a big, uh, big game which we are playing there, but I, no, I'm quite confident I, I, was, I was in the track limit there. Kevin, good drive. Thank you. You kind of think he would say that, wouldn't he? But it's a valid point he makes. At those speeds, a couple of centimetres either way. But in the old days of grass, people didn't drive all over the grass. They only do it now there's well, runoff tarmac. If they did drive over the grass, there's a big penalty. Absolutely. And of course, now there, there, there's virtually no penalty. Uh, the only penalty is a penalty applied by the race stewards or the race director because you've exceeded the track limit. And that's the, the old bone of contention. What is correct? What is incorrect? And you know, Kevin saying within two centimeters at the speed he's traveling at, that's a, f a valid point, but you can benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to affect the race because you've, we talked about it at Blanchimont. The other area that the race director is concerned about is going out of Eau Rouge up Radion. Now, depending on how much you gain depends on, of course, how lenient he's going to be, but four warnings. Otherwise, you're going to get a penalty. And it's potentially, it's not to a driver, it's to the car. So it doesn't matter whether you, you've been innocent uh, and it's your first transgression. If your co-driver has done it a lot, you're going to cop for the penalty. But that, over the course of 24 hours, will have a real effect on the race because we could be looking at people almost on a regular basis after the first hour or so coming in for drive-throughs or stop-goes or time penalties depending on how many times a car runs off the road and that could be this year's main talking point well i mean we could find in an hour's time a talking talking point could be about a, a grid which is completely different to what we've just seen in in this uh, top 20 shootout indeed so so 
we will see how things pan out in the race. First, though, just enjoy Spa. You're riding with Lawrence Van Tour. This was his second effort to do a time. John Talker's round. Right, I don't have a source, so it's absolutely flat out down the hill, and this camera doesn't really give you an indication just how steep the in decline is all the way past the, the heritage pitches, you might call them. Now, just a sort of little confidence lift, but essentially that's a pretty much as flat as you can be. Runs pretty wide over radio may just get away with that but a big big commitment from Lawrence Van for a man who personal pride wants to have this pole position he knows the value of it hard on the brakes you can hear that those carbon or the steel discs screeching so slightly compromised in the second part because he's just carrying so much speed then coming out of the final bit of Colomb again runs the curb on the outside no problem there then hard on the brakes down into Bruxelles just really it's about trying to get a get tight clean exit and then this corner which previously was known as a corner without any name again runs wide but that's acceptable the dial again another long downhill run into the double left hander it's called double gauche now but it actually is called Pouon great corner great field particularly this part where you again the whole car is moving with you as one and hard on the brakes back down into Fania the first part of this flick to the right again get the car position to get the maximum acceleration off so as that you can pick up that little tenth or so of a second back on the brakes into campus corner there's a, a college actually just to your right in the forest then through what is now known as Coop of Paul Frere previously known as Stavolo then the long uphill climb absolutely flat out through this long right hand curve and then gradually the curve to the left way over now that's marginal that is marginal but flat out through Blanchemont carries the speed 250 60 kilometers an hour then hard on the brakes key is to keep the car that's an ideal way to take the chicane kept the car to the middle to the right of the entry then gets a good straight line shot across the start finish line but it's not good enough for pole You'd have put money on Van Tour doing pole position, wouldn't you? It's a very interesting order that we've ended up with. And uh, Frank Stippler's efforts, 17,000, impressive. Now for Mark VDS Racing, Nick Katzberg, 8th, Maxime Martin, 12th. Let's hear from Team Boss, Baz Blinders. Baz, talk me through that qualifying session for your team. Well, uh, both drivers had a reasonable lap. I mean, this is uh, the limit that where we can go. Yesterday we were slightly faster because the qualifying was late. It was a bit uh, fresh air and, and we had there the maximum out of the car. So now track temperatures were a bit higher, so we were a little bit slower sort of than yesterday. And yeah, obviously the others still had in the pocket. Uh, and yeah, especially the Audi, as you can see, has pole position. And what does this race mean to your team? This is the big one, isn't it? Yeah, of course, it's an important race. We are a Belgian team. Uh, we've been here many years and, and we've been always been quite close to, uh, to, to, to be at the front uh, or we were on the podium. Um, so it is very important for us. We have a lot of sponsors, a lot of fans, a lot of family. So, uh, yeah, uh, but it's a big race for everybody. I mean, 24-hour uh, spa, it's growing every year. It's getting more and more important every year. So uh, it's not only for us, but also for the others. But to a Belgian team, though, so for people around the world, what does it mean to a Belgian team to win at Spa? Well, Belgium, it looks maybe small, but we are a great country. We are a big country. We have a lot of history in motor racing. I mean, Spa has been here so many years. We had Formula One here for 60 years ago. Uh, also, 24 hours of Spa is a very old race. Um, so a lot of people participate uh, in, in motor racing events and, and like it. So, so and all in all, I mean, this is very important for, for Belgium. And, and I'm very proud that this race internationally is also uh, very important. Baz, thank you. Pleasure. And of course, Belgian driver Maxime Martin was another that people anticipated could have been, would have been on pole position. He was only 12th in the end. Let's have a look at his lap now. Yeah, and I think just to develop a little bit of what Baz Landers was saying about the reason why they were slower in this shootout than they were last night. And it's principally temperature and it's ambient temperature, track temperature, but of all things, it's the rear tire temperature. At this point of the day, everything's getting that little bit hotter. The rear tires are that little bit hotter. There's a little bit less grip. Also, as you go into the evening, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, the air is denser. It's cooler. That gives you less tire temperature in the rear. Again, 
rear limited circuit, but it also gives you that little bit more dense air for downforce. So you've got a bit more downforce overall and on the rear of the car. So Baz sort of, sort of alluded to what the problems are. In, in essence, that is the core of the problem, and everybody suffered from it. It just so happened that it was Frank Stippler who managed to get the best handle on the circumstance conditions that we've got at this moment that we're about watching this lap. This is a replay, of course, of Maxime Martin. I mean, you look at the lap and you think, it's a perfect lap. He's driving the wheels off the BMW. Down the hill, into pool, down a gear. Turns in, gets just feathers the throttle and then gets on and hard. Stays well within track limits on the outside. Again, I think this is my favourite corner on the circuit. It's just one that makes you feel great. I know everybody talks about Eau Rouge and Blanchemont, but Pujo is a really great corner as well. So they flip flat that little bit through Fania. Short acceleration, back down the gear. On the throttle, come out of campus, within limits, running over the kerb. Now watching the exit over the Coeur Paul Frere, within the limits as well. We've seen other cars going completely four wheels off the racetrack coming out of Coeur Paul Frere. Now up the hill, watch where he places the BMW before he gets into Blanchemont. Is the whole car over? Well, he's just, I think, within the limits. And he's within the limits yeah. on the exit as well. So Maxime Martin has done the perfect lap, but it's just not quick enough. Now, how do you explain it? Well, Baz Landers told us. Hopefully I've alluded with a little bit more insight into what the, the core problem is. Everybody's got the same problem, but some handle it better than others. And the point you make about Maxime Martin being within track limits is borne out by the fact that he is not under investigation. Those that are, Maxime Soule, Vincent Abril, Bruno Spengler, Alvaro Parent, Kevin Est, Yelma Berman, Andre Lotterer, Nicky Tim, Andrea Piccini. <laughs> Is that all? That's all. It's only nine of oh, twenty. Well, I mean, actually, but so. well, let's Not just chuck thought. him out, put him on the back of the grid, <laughs> and we'll have an even more interesting. <laughs> so the story ain't done yet. Now this was the Lotterer Abril. He's flashing his lights long uh, no, before he catches it, it. It, it. Absolutely, he is entitled to be upset with the Audi driver. And I mean, Andre Lotterer is a, I mean, to me, the best driver in the Audi's Le Mans lineup. And he was preparing himself to go onto a lap, and Abril completely compromised. And it would have been easy, in my opinion, for Lotterer to have lifted off 200 metres before he got to the braking zone. He wouldn't have lost anything. And Abril would have gone through. OK, he might have had to overtake Abril as Abril would have been slowing down. But he's now yeah. going to be up in front of the judge. He might get a slap on the hands with a ruler or he might get something more severe. And the blue lights were flashing as well. It wasn't as if Lotterer didn't have awareness or should have had awareness that there was another car around. There was the flashing lights from Abril's Bentley. There was the blue light, the blue flag as well. So, yeah. It was uh, here that Andre made his F1 debut last year, but yeah. that, very unlike him. Yeah, you might say he's blue to rights on that one. <laughs> the language will be blue, won't it, if he uh, does get a penalty after that? Well, when we saw him talking to the Rosardi teammates and, and, and technicians, you can always tell by a driver's body language that, you know, he's immediately was defensive. Yes. Everything his yes. body language was saying is, I'm defending my position. Mm. It wasn't my fault. You know, I, I, you know, the rationale that you drive, you've got to make decisions literally in milliseconds as to what you're going to do. He made a decision. It compromised another driver on a flying lap. He may well get a penalty. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets dropped to the bottom of the top 20 shootout. Yeah, because that was his startup lap. Uh, so the, the, that time can't be disallowed, but it could be for uh, balking and therefore a different penalty to be applied. Uh, let's hear from Alvaro Parent next with OJ. Fourth, it's a great place to be on the grid. Yeah, fantastic, you know. Uh for the team, second and fourth uh, on the grid. Uh, right now, a little bit frustrated for me, as on my fast lap, I caught a car in Blenheim. I don't know really what he was doing because he was on his in lap and uh, went up in on the Aster turf. So on a, on a, a left hander, which is sixth gear flat, you know, uh, instead of getting out of the way, uh, I had to go up in on the Aster turf and everything. But uh, anyway, uh, it's just such a long race. You always want to be a bit higher up, you know, and the difference is so small. Uh, it could have been there, you know, the, the, the pole, but um, anyway, happy for the team. We're motivated, focusing on the race. Um, we're all prepared and, you know, go, go from there. It's very, very long and see, see if we all can do our best and uh, what comes out of it. What's the best strategy for a 24-hour race? Is it consistency? In my opinion, is um, everything smoothly, obviously fast, 
no mistakes uh, for anyone, t whole team, drivers. Be careful with obviously the slower drivers, and uh, uh, but at the same time try to overtake them as fast as possible um, and take care of, of the car uh, but at the same time being fast, do you know what I mean? And taking uh, not too much curbs and you know all these small details make the difference in such a long race um, and that's what, um, what we've got to focus on. Good luck for the race tomorrow. Thanks mate, thank you. Well, as Rob Smedley would say, Alvaro, baby, you had four wheels off the track before you got into Blanchemont. I understand the exit, but not the entry. So we'll see if anything does go his way by a penalty. This coming into the Spa 24 hours is how we look in the Pro Cup in the Championship. Alex Buncombe, Katsamao Sachio and Wolfgang Wright, a car that didn't get into the top 20, of course. We haven't seen it in the Super Pole. Uh, that is the Championship leading car by a point from Stephen Kay and Andy American Guy Smith by a point from Lawrence Van Tour, Robin Frins and Jean-Carl Verne, but of course they are now split for the weekend. Robin Frins uh, and Jean-Carl Verne pair up with Stefan Rochelmi for the purposes of the 24 hours, whereas you have now Lawrence Van Tour with René Rast and Marcus Winkelhock going for back-to-back -back victories in this race. The rest of the Pro Cup, you can see it's very, very competitive all the way through. Just a single point in many cases, splitting drivers. Of course, 24 hours at Spa, points scored at the 6, the 12 and the 24 hour mark. So it is important as far as the championship is concerned uh, because of when and how many points you can score over the course of the weekend. The race itself begins tomorrow afternoon here at half past four and it is an opportunity now to have a look back at some of the highlights of Super Pole in anticipation of tomorrow's start of the total 24 hours of Spa. Bentley out first, Mercedes rumble down the pit lane next and getting it a little bit ragged was Stephen Kane who ran wide coming out of Lecom and hooked it onto the dirt. Vincent Avril's unexpected occurrence with Andre Lotterer means that the pair of them will go and have a word with the stewards and Andre Lotterer looking at the evidence more and more really isn't in a very good place, nor Franck Pereira, because it was his BMW that forced Alvaro Parent to take evasive action. But Frank Stippler is the man at the end of the session who comes through to take the provisional pole position. Audi then, victorious, as we go to the 24 hours of Spa at half past four tomorrow. For now, from OJ Ball, John Watson and David Addison, bye-bye. <laughs> Yeah.